Let us pray. Gracious God, on this Easter morning, Easter morning, this most glorious of days, this most beautiful of days, may your word and the way Mark tells his story impact our lives, that we would be able to go and to, to, to tell and to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ the Lord, Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. I get goosebumps every Easter when I hear that hymn, and especially when we're able to sing it together. get goosebumps and I usually get a tear in my eye and a lump in my throat as I did already twice today. He is risen. He is risen indeed. For me, that's another goosebump moment every Easter Sunday when we say that together. I cannot tell you how much I missed those goosebumps last Easter. Last Easter, it was meaningful and it was lovely what we did for, for, for us and, and I think for others as well. But we vid what we did was we videotaped the worship over the days before Easter. And so we weren't together doing that like we are now at home and here. There is something, there's something about Easter that moves us, that touches us in ways that are not easy to describe. And I think which also draw many people back to the church. Last week, there was yet another one of these surveys, and they always seem to be going in the same direction. Saying that church, another one verified that church attendance continues to drop. This time, what they said was it is actually, the, for the first time, dropped below 50% of the population in America. Well, not today. Even in a pandemic, I guarantee you, at home or here and elsewhere and at various times, people are tuning in. And I believe this tells us something very important about ourselves. And including, I believe, many who, who, even the most questioning among us. And that is that we long for something from God. And likewise, that we long for the world and for our lives to be better, to be more loving, and less fearful. And we also long to make a difference. And maybe also somewhere deep in our hearts, we believe that God, that Jesus, will help make that possible. Easter is a day of profound hope for ourselves and for the world. And so here we are today, craving hope in a world that we know is often not demonstrating a lot of hope. <clears throat> and we come to our reading today from the Gospel of Mark, Mark's unique way of telling the resurrection story with an ending that actually leaves us hanging. It's an ending that for many, truthfully, with, throughout the history of the church, have many have found it an unsatisfactory ending, and some find it uncomfortable. In fact, at first blush, I think what we could say is that we're left instead, the way it ends, the way we're left, is not so much with hope, 
but with fear. One member of our Thursday morning Bible study where we talk about the readings for the coming Sunday, she suggested, tongue in cheek, she suggested that what I should do is I should read the reading and I should sit down and see how people react. She was kidding, of course, because we definitely need to look more closely at this reading. Now, for starters, Mark's version of the Easter story, it's the only one that does not include any resurrection sightings or meetings. But I don't think that's the issue. Mary Magdalene, in the story Mary Magdalene, and, and, and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, three very courageous women. That's important to see. These, I say courageous because in those days, it was a dangerous time to be associated with a man who was put to death by the state. These three courageous women, they go to the cave where Jesus had been laid, and as was the custom of the day, they would, uh, and in their faith, they, would, they went to anoint him, and what they find is that the stone, this very large stone, has been rolled away, and the tomb is open, and instead, when they go in, instead of finding Jesus' body, they meet a young man in a white robe. And our translation says they are alarmed. And I've got to say, that is just feels like a gigantic understatement. So this man, this young man calmly, calmly tells them not to be alarmed by explaining, explaining that he has been raised. Can that really be explained? And he next, this, this young man, he next instructs them to go and to tell the other disciples and Peter, and then for them all to go up north to their home where they're all from, and where Jesus was from too, to go back home to Galilee, and there Jesus would meet them. Ah, but then comes the last verse, verse 8. And it's not at all what we expect on Easter morning. No goosebumps here. Let me read it. Verse 8. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The end! Seriously? They were afraid? The end? Does fear really get the last word? On the resurrection? This ending troubled plenty of people, especially in the early days of the church. And so what a number of very well-meaning early Christians did is they came up with different endings. You can actually see them in a lot of Bibles. There, some of them are in the footnote or some of them are actually in, are bracketed. The two different endings in the version of the Bible that we use. And some others, some of these other well-meaning folks, they tried to explain away the lack of this that it ended this way by saying that, well, these are ancient manuscripts and they were fragile and, and, and maybe it just fell off, the, ancient, the most ancient manuscripts. That actually seems plausible. But what if, what if, as pretty much everyone is in unanimity on today, especially the scholarly community. What if we assume that the author, that Mark, ended the story this way on purpose? What is this ending telling us? Was he doing this to leave us wanting more? Kind of prompting us to wonder where the story would go in our lives and in the world. Wanting us to stay tuned and then be on the edge of our seats. And that makes sense to me. Saying that the resurrection, it's not an ending, it's a beginning. I like that. It's a good way to think about the resurrection in our lives. But why? Still, we have to ask, why that silence and that fear? We know that these women obviously eventually went and told Otherwise, 
we wouldn't be here. Why? The silence and the fear at the ending here. To a degree, of course, fear makes sense. What were they afraid of? Did they worry? Maybe it's that they worried that the empty tomb, that it was a fraud, some sort of a trick. There was a trick being played on them, maybe to out them as, as associates, as, as followers of this man who'd just been, maybe the Roman guards were trying to trick them so that they would implicate themselves. That too makes some sense. It makes sense that the women might think that. Regardless, this was a traumatic time for these women and for all of the disciples who had devoted the last three years of their lives to being with him and to following him. And they were sad and they were disoriented and all of their hopes, their great hopes for him had been dashed. The very people and the forces that they were pushing against seemed, those forces and people seemed to have won. Of course, fear was going to be part of the mix of emotions that they would feel, but there would also be the glimmer of hope in that moment and excitement. But fear is the way it ends. <clears throat> but could there also be now, but all, could there also have been then another kind of fear at play? a kind of fear that we can all relate to? Could they also have been afraid this mind-bending news was true? Scott Black Johnston, who is a, an esteemed pastor up in New York at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian, here's what he says about that. He says, to answer that question, we might consider what our own fears could be this Easter? Could we be afraid that after this glorious day, we would simply return to life tomorrow unchanged? Or also, might we be worried, <clears throat> might we be worried about the implications if Jesus really is waiting for us in Galilee? Or I add, in Miami. One thing we know about this Jesus is that he did not agree to go up on that cross just so that the world could return to business as usual. We know that he gave us work to do in the field of compassion and love and forgiveness. The implications of Jesus' res resurrection are profound and they're challenging and they're also life altering. And very often they can throw our best laid plans off balance, causing us to ask questions about how we can do better. And I can tell you that as a pastor and from very personal experience, I sometimes cringe when I start to ask those questions, especially the question, what would Jesus do in this moment or in that moment? That answer can certainly make pastors, but it can make everyone plenty uncomfortable and can challenge us to the core in what we say and what we do in our lives. And also, if God really is that in charge of life and ultimately of death, and that God is present now, watching us, with us, we do want to ask a lot of questions of ourselves and of God. But it is precisely, I believe, in those questions that we find hope for life. And I think also eternity. If he is risen and he really is out there ready to meet us, it's then, it's then that we can really see Easter as a new beginning, as a do-over, as a reboot, as a fresh start. This time with Jesus as our partner.
Friends, as we begin to come out of the pandemic and we return to some sort of normalcy, each of us coming from different places, different directions, having different experiences, some having lost loved ones or lost jobs or feeling isolated or, or lonely or bored and many other experiences. Fear of getting back to normal, it's a real thing because we know, we don't know, I should say, we don't know yet what the new normal will look like. But as we come out of this, and we are and we will, maybe what we can see is this is an opportunity. We can see this as a reboot of our lives and how we live and also how we treat each other. We can see it as a chance to meet the risen one and to really hear all that he had to say all that he had to say about how to live more loving lives, less fearful lives, more hopeful lives, and even eternal lives. Amen.